In the last video, I got exclusive access to the final assembly line of Eurofighter Typhoon to discover how Airbus builds their fighter jets. Today, let's talk about prototyping and how one special aircraft, IPA-7, plays a crucial role in upgrading Eurofighter. Joining me is Grisu, a test pilot who is one of the people that jumps into the aircraft to make all of this happen. So Grisu, tell me a little bit about this machine. This is uh, our IPA-7. It's mm -hmm. uh, one of our instrumented production aircraft. It's a basically a tranche 3 aircraft which we use for aerodynamic testing, handling quality testing, avionic system testing, so anything uh, that we do uh, related to software upgrades in the aircraft. What are you working on right now with Airbus on Eurofighter? Um, so right now we're in, in the middle of a developmental upgrade for the, for the Typhoon. Uh, one of the enhancement packages is mm -hmm. the bigger, bigger software packages that take quite a bit um, to be installed in the aircraft. And as part of that, we're doing mainly avionic system testing in all regards, be it uh, weapon system performance, be it uh, sensor performance. So all kinds of avionic system testing that is part of this enhancement package. And how long does that usually take then to be transferred to operational Eurofighters? Well, depending on, on what kind of package this, if it's one of those big enhancement packages, it takes quite long and can be between contract and delivery up to a couple of years but it's a very complex full update of the whole system. If you look into smaller individual updates or national upgrades, those are a lot quicker. This one is one of the big packages, so it really takes a couple of years from the time the customer decides what they want to the time it's actually delivered to the customer in the aircraft. And I mean, I suppose this really depends on what you're developing, but how many flights do you usually take until something is then actually integrated into your flight? Uh, you can't really say that. It really depends on what systems are impacted by development and how many flights you need. Um, when we do the flying, there's, there's various things that we do. First of all, developmental, we try to figure out if everything works as required and works as designed, if there's glitches in the software. And there'll be a number of cycles where we find issues, they are upgraded, and then we recheck them and see if there's still the same problem or if, if the problem has been fixed. But also during the testing, what we do is um, we prove specification compliance. Mm -hmm. Basically, you know, we try to prove that the customer will receive what he ordered and the system works as he wants it to work. And we also do certification work. So anything that changes on the aircraft will need to be certified by airworthiness authorities. And they need proof from flight tests that the system is working as designed, working as specified and can be certified for flight operation. What's the difference here when flight testing uh, between doing a software update and hardware? How, do, how is that different for you as a, as a test pilot? Um, and it, actually, it's not because okay. uh, the difference that you'll be seeing is are you doing avionic system testing, system testing, or do you do handling quality testing? So it depends on what changes within the aircraft. Mm -hmm. um, if it's a software or hardware component, it doesn't really matter. It's really what the impact on the use of the aircraft will be. So, for example, if you change a software or hardware product that will have an impact on the avionic system integration or on how to use the weapon as a weapon system, then you'll do uh, avionic system testing. If you have a change in flight control laws in the software, for example, that's where you do handling quality testing, um, where you actually, as the pilot, try to figure out if the aircraft still flies in the way it's supposed to be flying. But it really comes down to what the impact is, not what changes. And sort of from your career here at Airbus, what would you say was the most challenging introduction of like a, a new system? I think the challenging, well, the most interesting from my point of view definitely was uh, when we did the first testing on the AEMK. It's called the aerodynamic mod kit, where we changed the layout, the aerodynamic layout of the aircraft to get a better um, performance and better qualities in regards to what you can carry on the aircraft. And that's basically, we, we did envelope expansion back then. So we flew the aircraft in parts of the envelope where it hadn't been flown before in regards to angle of attack, for example. So for a test pilot, because then it comes down to piloting skills, mm -hmm. that is really the most challenging and interesting one. But all the other programs, avionic system upgrades, um, hardware upgrades, sensor upgrades, they are very interesting from a technical point of view mm -hmm. and also from the operational point of view, because that's where the biggest impact will happen to the user. So. I couldn't say one of the things would have been the most challenging yeah. or the best, but the biggest fun I had, obviously, with the AMK program where you go beyond the boundaries of what has been done before. Okay. And I mean, Eurofighter has seen a lot of 
upgrades from tranche one over to tranche four now. Yeah. Talk me through what some of those. Um, how, how has that sort of developed the trajectory of Eurofighters and the capabilities? Well, if you look to, at the, in the initial design of Europe, it was designed as a you know, air superiority fighter, as an interceptor. Nowadays, the, the Eurofighter is a full up swing roll, multi roll aircraft with all types of sensors, air to surface, air to air weapons. A lot of new air to air weapons that have been integrated. So it's a you know, it's not a stepwise approach. It just matured with, with the environment. It matured with all the new weapons that became available, new ordnance that became available, and new technology for sensors. As you see, for example, the E-Scan radar, mm -hmm. it's a new technology, a relatively new technology for sensor-wise. And that's the way it continuously evolves into a tranche for later on into long-term evolution plan, where then the Eurofighter actually will be upgraded to be part of the future combat air system. Mm. So it's a continuous process that can't be done with individual steps, but it's continuous involvement of, of the system. And where do you see the sort of the potential then going from Eurofighter over to the future combat system? As, as sort of a test platform. Do you see that being used, the Eurofighter there in that well, regard? Well, yeah, it will have to be because, as you understand, the future combat air system is not, it's not a new aircraft. Yeah. It's you know, an integration of all kinds of systems. Yeah. So obviously the Typhoon as the backbone of, of the German Air Force will yeah. be part of that future combat air system. So it needs to be integrated. The good thing about this, uh, that we now have aircraft here that you can use as test aircraft, where you can do the stepwise integration. Mm -hmm. For example, topics like manned, unmanned teaming. Yeah. They will be part of the Eurofighter program and the progress you made there is being transferred into Eurofighter as well as into future combat air system in the, in the future there. Um, one of the concepts will be to take a two-seat Eurofighter, take the rear cockpit and evolve it into a long-term evolution cockpit mm -hmm. uh, with other displays, other sensors and uh, different uh, possibilities to do unmanned, unmanned teaming as an example. Yeah. And then one will be flying in a couple of years. And so we can use that as a demonstrator, but also as a test platform for us and for the operational pilots to evolve their operational techniques. So it's a very challenging, interesting future that's lying ahead. Yeah. And I mean, we don't have a crystal ball, so we don't quite know what is going to happen in the mm -hmm. future. But where would you see then as a pilot the biggest changes from what we have now with fourth and fifth gen aircraft? Mm -hmm to over to that sixth generation of combat aircraft. Yeah. I mean, already now the pilot is more of a mission manager mm -hmm. than a pilot. Even in Typhoon, yes, you have the standard pilot things that you still need to be doing, but you have a massive amount of information that you receive and that you can hand out to your uh, partners. Mm -hmm. In the future, in the front future combat air system, actually you will be 95% of a mission manager. Mm -hmm. Uh, you will have the command authority over various assets within your flight, within your package. Mm -hmm. And you need to focus on that aspect of your, of your work. Flying will be part of it, but it shouldn't be, you know, it's like the aircraft will get you to your work and get you back home. Mm -hmm. But your work is going to be mission manager uh, of a large package. And is that then going to be with, you know, remote carriers or is that just going to be with, you know, next generation fighters? No, I mean, it's, it's one of those buzzwords that come along, you know, the remote carriers, loyal wingmen. Um, it will not be only that. What you have to imagine is you'll be an integral part of a big system of systems. It's yeah. also one of those buzzwords, but it's a good description. You'll be an integral part with all types of senders, command platforms, other aircraft, other entities on the ground, in the air, uh, on the sea. And it might be a remote carrier that you could be under your command, but it might be manned assets as well that you communicate with, that you task without having to use radios or anything, just because of the way it's being used, the way tasking is being used then. So it will be a variety of options for the pilot, which means that you will have to need, have a very good integration of the cockpit, very good human machine interfaces to allow a single pilot to well manage all the information and all the authorities that he has. And I mean, you've mentioned earlier to me that you uh, started your career on Tornado. Where do you sort of see, in, in a nutshell, the biggest differences between Eurofighter and Tornado? Well, the Tornado, I mean, it's an old airframe, but still being developed um, after 50 years of, of flying time. The biggest difference is back in the Tornado days, we started with a very sort of analog cockpit. That's why you have a, a two-person crew mm -hmm. in a Tornado. It's just impossible for a single guy in a Tornado to do all the stuff that you have to do. So the weapon system oper operator will take care of the system. Reason being, the way the cockpit was designed is from the 60s, 70s. Mm -hmm. So back then it was top-notch technology, but it just wasn't possible to supply the pilot with a kind of HMI that allows him to do it all on his own. Mm -hmm. The Typhoon is 
definitely a step ahead there. It has a lot of information, but it's presented in a way such to the pilot that he can handle most of it on his own. Um, but again, that's technology from the 80s, 90s, mm. where we are now with the amount of information that you have are hitting a wall, if you will, of what the capabilities of the pilot allow him to do. And this is where the long-term evolution, where AFCAS now comes into play, where we say, okay, the amount of info, the amount of data, the amount of options that you have will massively increase. And that's why we will have to work on the human-machine interface and the way a pilot uses his aircraft as a weapon system and command platform. I mean, one of the questions you often see is uh, people wondering, how come with all the technology we have nowadays, how come we cannot just integrate this into the machines that are already available? So, so what are sort of the, the hardware and also the software limitations there that make that impossible? Well, I mean, it's, it's basically it's the same as in, in the commercial market. If you look at your mobile phone, for example, you know, you've got there's awesome games that you can play in a little break. It will, all kinds of things happen on your smartphone. Now, take that game, you will not be able to use it on a smartphone from five years ago, yeah. just because the hardware evolved and, and needs to you know, keep up with the software. And it's basically it's the same for the new aircraft, with all the capabilities, the data, the data required by weapons, the data coming from sensors, you will just have to adapt the hardware to be able to cope with that massive flow of information, mm -hmm. the massive flow of data. You won't have the bandwidth and the computing power to work with all you can receive from the outside, so you have to upgrade it. Yeah. Well, where do you see sort of the, the, the main advantages of the HMI we have nowadays compared to, to tornado days? Is this just the terms of displays? Is this in terms of the control setup? Is this in terms of having kind of moved away from analog switches over to digitalization? Um, well, it's, it, it, start, it begins with the kind of displays that you have. So in the tornado, we started off with a moving map display with a microfilm behind it. Mm -hmm. If you look at tornado nowadays, actually the avionic and the cockpit, the HMI and the cockpit is very modern. Yeah. And my, my dad, he flew tornadoes. If you set him into, strapped in a tornado f nowadays, yeah. he wouldn't recognize the cockpit. Okay. Um, so it has been upgraded. But the, the biggest difference really is the way you can present data and the flexibility you have with digital displays. Yeah. And that will go even further if you go into large area displays. The flexibility you now have, what information you want to present at what time, in what format, that will change. Now, with that option to have a lot of different display capabilities also comes a big risk. Um, so if you can, you know, if you can do a lot of changes to a display, there's a lot of options to screw up the display. Yeah. And that's where, you know, the development comes in, the developmental process where you have all those software engineers, human factor engineers who have a hard work, a hard time saying, okay, we got so many options now. How do we squeeze them in the cockpit in a way such that any pilot can use them? And it's a big challenge, but it's an interesting challenge because that's where also piloting community is involved in the yeah. developmental process, where you say, okay, this makes sense. This does not make sense from operational point of view, mm -hmm. but the engineering side needs it. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting process right now. And how much of your time nowadays as a pilot compared to when you started off is actually spent heads down rather than heads up with you know, helmet mount displays as well? You have, you've probably seen a big shift there. It's a bit difficult for me to judge because mm -hmm. the way I'm flying is a whole different thing than operational flying. Okay. I'm, I'm very sure that, um, especially in, in, in the Eurofighter world, beyond visual range, there's a lot of time spent head down, a lot of time spent in the helmet mount displays. Mm -hmm. It goes further probably when you go to JSF, um, where mm -hmm. they have a very good helmet mounted display and a lot of information on their displays. But I couldn't put a number on it. Um, that's something where you really have to talk to the operational experts and, and they will probably tell you something along those lines. Griso, thank you very much. You're welcome, anytime. Please also show your appreciation to Airbus and Griso in the comments and join us next time on AirPower21 when Griso takes us behind the scenes into the future prototyping lab where Airbus is currently experimenting on how pilots can work collaboratively with autonomous systems for future aircraft platforms. Ja, wunderbar. Perfect, perfect timing. Perfect, perfect timing. <laughs> uh, it's time for Brotzeit now, that's, that's probably so, the reason. Yeah.